guys, Miss Miklos here with the Chapter 8 review. And I'm going to start with just a few general um, sequences here, where it's giving us the equation, but it does not specify if it is arithmetic or geometric. So if it asks us to find the first five terms, I'm simply going to substitute in for n. So if I'm finding a sub 1, I'm doing 2 times 1 over 1 plus 1. 2 over 2 is 1. Okay, so I know my first value is 1. For a sub 2, that means I'm substituting 2 in for n. So I would get 4 over 3. My 3 looks kind of weird there. There we go. It still looks weird, but we can tell it's a 3. Okay, a sub 3, I would do 2 times 3 over 3 plus 1, which is 6 over 4, or 3 halves. A sub 4, you guessed it, is 2 times 4 over 4 plus 1, which would be 8 over 5. And then lastly, we need to find a sub 5, which is 2 times 5 over 5 plus 1, or 10 over 6, which is 5 over 3. And that one's really ugly. Here we go. So 5 over 3. So this would be our answer to that particular problem. Okay, so if I'm finding terms, I know I can just substitute in for n, and I'm replacing it with sub 1, sub 2, sub 3, sub 4, sub 5, to give me these first five terms. So our next problem here, we notice we have the summation symbol, and we need to find the sum. And this is the equation we're going to be using. And it tells us the first term is when k equals 4, and the upper limit of summation is when k equals 7. So it really means I'm figuring out what is the fourth term, the fifth term, the sixth term, and the seventh term. So I'm going to do 3 times 4 plus 1 plus 3 times 5 plus 1 plus 3 times 6 plus 1 and lastly 3 times 7 plus 1. So I have 13 plus 16 plus 19 plus 22, 70. So some key things we need to remember here is this is how we are finding all those terms. The lower number here is the term that I'm starting with, and our upper limit is the term I am ending with. Moving on now to arithmetic sequences, there are going to be some problems that are going to ask us to find the first five terms. So in a problem like this, okay, it's giving me my second term and my fifth term. What we really need to do is figure out what is our common difference. So we need to use our nth term formula, a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. We do not have a sub 1, so I'm going to temporarily say that 4 is a sub 1. And if I'm moving everything up one place in our sequence, then 13 becomes our fourth term. So I'm going to say 13 equals 4 plus 4 minus 1 times d. So 13 equals 4 plus 3d. When I subtract 4, I get 9 equals 3d, so 3 is our common difference. So at this point, I know that my second term is 4, and I know that my fifth term is 13. If I want to move backwards, I can actually subtract our common difference and get 1. If I want to move forwards, I would add our common difference and get 7, 10, and if I add it again, I would get 13. So this problem really showed us two different things. It showed us our nth term formula, which you guys need to have memorized. It also showed us how to rename these terms when necessary. The other thing we need to know with arithmetic is how to find the sum. Okay, so we know that the formula for arithmetic sum is n over 2 e times a sub 1 plus a sub n. So the two things I really need to know here is what is a sub 1 and what is a sub n. And if we look at the information given to us, it tells us we're starting at the first term and we're ending at the tenth term. So I'm going to say s sub 10 
equals 10 over 2 times, I need to figure out what is the first term. So I'm going to substitute 1 in for n, and I would get 7. Then I need to figure out what is the tenth term. So I'm going to do 2 times 10 plus 5, which is 25. So I have 10 over 2 times the quantity 7 plus 25 which ends up being 160. So we can see that if I know something is arithmetic, using this formula saves us a bunch of time because I did not have to find each of the terms separately and then find the sum. We could simply find the first term and find the nth term. In this case, since it said 10 up here, that's how I knew I needed to find the 10th term. Okay, but all I would need to do is find those two and then I can use this formula. So those are the two formulas for arithmetic you guys need to have memorized. Now moving on to geometric, here's when it tells me it's geometric. It tells us the first term, the second term, and we need to find what the seventh term is. So I know that my formula for geometric is a sub n equals a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1 power. And we know that we need to find the seventh term. My first term is 15, and I notice a slight problem here because I do not know what the ratio is. However, we know the ratio is any term divided by the previous term. So since we are given two consecutive terms, I can go ahead and figure out that our ratio is 1 third. So I have a sub 7 equals 15 times 1 third to the sixth power. This is when I really want to use math frac in my calculator to help me out. Okay, when I do 15 times 1 third to the seventh power, it gives me like a decimal of 0 0.0068587, so forth. But I'm going to use math frac, and it reduces it to 5 over 729. Now, just a reminder, the reason why the answers will look like this is because that is an exact answer. So we definitely need to have this formula memorized in order to be successful on our test. Okay, so looking at this problem, it's telling us it's geometric, and when I see this symbol, I know it means summation. So I need to remember what is our sum formula for geometric. And so if I'm using this sum formula, okay, I know I'm finding the sum after four terms because our upper limit of summation is four. I need to find my first term, so I'm going to do a sub one equals three to the one plus one power, which would be nine. So I'm gonna say the sum of four terms is nine times, and in this case, um, I can't really tell what is my ratio. As we said previously, a ratio is any term divided by the previous term. So I'm going to go ahead and find the second term. 3 to the 2 plus 1. Okay, 3 cubed is 27. So our ratio would be 27 over 9, which is 3. And you guys might remember that we said whatever the base is is actually our ratio. So I have 1 minus 3 to the 4th power over 1 minus 3. And this is something that we can go ahead and put straight into our calculator. Once again, the important thing here is the way that I'm using my parentheses. So I need to put parentheses around the fraction. I also need to put parentheses around my numerator. Excuse me. And I also need to put parentheses around my denominator. And when I put that all in, I end up getting 360 is our sum. Okay, so that tells us the four formulas that you guys need to have memorized for our test. Okay, the next concept I want to go through is our binomial theorem. So it's telling me I need to expand this binomial. So the first thing I'm going to do is figure out what would my coefficients be. Since our exponent is 4, Okay, I'm going to do 4 combination 0, 4 combination 1, 4 combination 2, all the way up until I end with having my r value be 4 as well. Now, I can put all these into our calculator, but we may also remember that 4 combination 0 and 4 combination 4 are both 1. 
4 combination 1 is 4, and so is 4 combination 3. And our middle one is 6. Okay, rem just a reminder, the way to put this in our calculator, I'm typing in this in value, then I'm going to math probability in CR, and then I would type in whatever our R value is. Okay, so I've spaced out our coefficients. Now, I notice this is my first term. So I'm going to start by taking x to the fourth power, and each subsequent term is going to be one degree lower. Likewise, I'm going to look at 2y, and I'm going to start with that to the zero power, and each subsequent term is going to be increased. So I'm trying to fit it all in here. Now I need to do some multiplication. So this is telling me 1 times x to the 4th times 1, which is x to the 4th. My next term is telling me 4 times x cubed times 2 times y, which would be 8, <coughs> excuse me, 8x cubed y. My next one is telling me 6 times x squared times 2 squared times y squared, which would be 24x squared y squared. Next, okay, and I'm going to write it up here, I have 4 times x times 2 cubed times y cubed. I know 2 cubed is 8, 8 times 4 is 32, so I have 32xy cubed. Lastly here, Okay, I have 1 times 1 times 2 to the 4th times y to the 4th, which would be plus 16y to the 4th. So, our steps in this. First thing is I needed to figure out my coefficients. Then I'm taking my first term and I'm starting at the n power and I'm decreasing each term. I'm looking at my second term and I'm starting to the zero power and I'm increasing each term. Then I'm simply simplifying each of those terms to get our final answer. Okay, the last thing we're gonna get into here is some probability. And if we look at this question, it asks us how many license plates can be formed if there's one number followed by three letters and then three numbers. So, um, if there's a question like this, it'll be really specific in how we want it outlined. And notice there are no restrictions given, like with zeros or other things, so I can assume that we could use every digit, we can use every letter. So, I know that there are 10 spots in that first place because I know there are 10 different options for numbers. Then I'm going to have 26, 26, 26 because those are my letters. Then lastly, 10, 10, and 10, because those are all numbers once again. Okay, so notice this is a fundamental counting principle problem. So in my calculator, I'm doing 10 to the fourth times 26 to the third power, and I get a giant number of 17576000. Now, a follow up question what if nothing can repeat? Then all of a sudden, my options are a little bit different. Okay, my first number, I still have 10 options. My first letter, I still have 26. But then, if I know whatever letters here cannot be here or here, in this spot I would only have 25 options and then 24 options. If I know whatever numbers here cannot be anywhere else, I would have 9 options and then 8 options and then 7 options. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do 10 times 26 times 25 times 24 times 9 times 8 times 7 and that gives me 7862400. Zero, zero, zero. 
So even though those are still a lot of options, we can definitely see that the different values are decreasing. Okay, so this is just a good example of fundamental counting principle where I'm looking at each value, each event separately and figuring out how many options could possibly happen there. Six girls are standing or trying to stand in a row to take a picture. How many arrangements could they be in? And this word arrangements just pops out at me and that makes me think order, which is a permutation. Okay, so remember, if I don't think it's fundamental counting principle, which actually in this case, I could use fundamental counting principle, um, I need to see is it order, is it not order? Here, order is important and that word arrangement kind of shows that to me. So one way I could do this, I know my total number of girls are six and there are six different people I'm trying to arrange. The other way we could have done this with fundamental counting principle would be if I have six girls, okay, there would only be five options and then four, three, two, and one. You guys also could have used six factorial. Okay, so when I go ahead and put this in my calculator, I end up getting 720 different ways that these six girls could all be standing and in arrangement. Okay, so key thing I need to ask myself, is order important? When order is important, it is a permutation. Miss Smithlos is going to go on vacation and I'm choosing four books out of my library of 100 or of 80 books to take on vacation. In how many ways could I select the books? Okay, now the first thing I need to think of is does order matter here? Okay, if my favorite book is, I don't know, Harry Potter, okay, does it matter if I bring that book first or if, I, if it's my fourth choice? And the answer here is no. So I know that we have a combination. So I'm taking 80 books and I'm choosing only four of them. So in my calculator, okay, I'm going to have to type in 80 and then choose NCR and then go ahead and type in four and it tells me that there are 1581580 different ways that I could go ahead and choose four books. Okay, so once again, we're thinking to ourselves, is order important? If it's not important, then I know that it is a combination. And our last problem, okay, in this problem it talks about per distinguishable permutations of the letters of the word banana. Okay, so with distinguishable permutations, remember that was when we had repeating elements. So the first thing I want to look at is how many different letters do we have in banana? And if we look, we actually have six different letters. So I'm putting six factorial. Now I need to look at the repeats. So if I look at B, notice it does not repeat, so I don't need to worry about it. A, we have one, two, three different A's. So I have to put three factorial down in my denominator. With my n's, I notice I have two n's, so I'm gonna put two factorial. Now with that b, if you guys really wanted to put one factorial, that's fine, but we know one factorial is simply one. So it does not change our final answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and do six factorial divided by 3 factorial sorry I'm messing around on my calculator here 3 factorial times 2 factorial and when I go ahead and do that I get that there are 60 different ways that we could arrange these letters in the word banana Okay, so I know this video was quick and to the point, but hopefully it just gives you an overall glimpse of what you are expected to know for our test that is coming up.